Now, I'd like us to, I'd like to recognize those who have come for the first time to worship with us at CCBC. Is this your first time at CCBC? If it is, I know, you know, medyo jahe, but, you know, wave your hand a bit like that. I'd like to recognize you. Are you here? Dito po, do we have first-time visitors here? Just wave your hand like that if this is your first time. Wala po, here on my left, are there first-time visitors? Oh, there, there she is. Yes. Welcome. And we're happy to have you worship with us. And how about here on this side? Uh, how about in the balcony? Do we have first timers there? Oh, there. Ah, among our uh, deaf congregation. Tom. Tom is there. Tom. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. And, and of course, uh, before we begin, I'd like you to greet each other and especially our guests with a warm CCBC welcome. And then, you know, declare peace with each other. Give your peace greeting with one another. Okay, I'd like you to stand up and let's give the peace greeting, okay? And if you may, you might want to invite your new acquaintance for lunch. Kung walang lunch, at least coffee. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God to bless us as we study His Word. Father, speak to us in a special way as we open Your Word. We pray that You will bless us and cause us, Lord, to respond and to, be, to leave out Your Word and to experience your power, power to change. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Since December, we are doing a, a series of studies for those, for the visitors who are here. We're doing a series of studies on the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we started with the birth narratives, and in January, we look at the inauguration narratives. And out of that inauguration narratives, it's not working again. Jesus announced his ministry to go this way. Quoting from the book of Isaiah, and the Gospel of Luke gives it to us, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So this, in essence, is a summary of the public ministry of Jesus. And in the process, in the chapters after Luke chapter 4, he, we see him doing exactly the same thing. Healing the sick, proclaiming the word of God, setting those who are in bondage free. And at the same time, while he does that, he chose disciples, followers, students of his, to learn what he is doing in order to continue on with that ministry. So he wanted to see his disciples to be competent in proclaiming the word and exercise, competent in exercising his authority to bring about change, to bring about transformation and in the fulfillment of his mission. There is a part in the mission of Jesus that the church has to fulfill. And that there is a part in the mission of Jesus wherein only Jesus himself can fulfill. And that is the work on the cross in Calvary. The rest of what he did, he delegated it to his disciples. That's why in the Gospels, you will see their stories after stories uh, portraying Jesus, teaching other people portraying Jesus healing, portraying Jesus demonstrating his power. Actually, he was teaching his disciples how to continue on the ministry that he has started. And he would like to see that the whole world will know more about God. And as a result, they would have an opportunity 
to experience His grace, the grace of the forgiveness of God through Jesus' death on the cross, and at the same time, opportunity to worship God as well. Today, we're going to take a look at this portion in, in the Gospel of Luke. That's the whole of Luke chapter 8. It is a long passage with a series of stories, but it has two important themes which represents the two skills, the two elements that Jesus wanted his disciples to master. That's why I entitled this sermon as the word to proclaim the power to change. Jesus was training his disciples the word to proclaim and training his disciples to use the power to bring a change in this world. I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 8. I'll be reading in my version, and you will be following quietly. Let us all stand in reverence to the reading of God's Word. Verse 1, it goes this way. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirit and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. I just want to pause a bit from here. You will see here Luke emphasizing that it's not only the men who were followers of Jesus. There were also women and women of different stature. They were supporting and following Jesus. They were also called to be sent out to serve as well. I highlighted this because it's highlighted in the Bible and it so happens it's also Women's Month this March. Happy Women's Month. Ayan. And it's also Fire Prevention man Month. So I don't know why fire prevention go along with me. Anyway, let's continue on reading the Bible here. Uh, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer, farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was carrying the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no, more, no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And then when he said that, this, he called out, He who, uh, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I would like you to jump, to put, uh, jump towards verse 21. And Jesus replied, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. And then I would like to uh, jump now to verse 24. And the disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And then let's go now to chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. This is the word of the Lord and he is going to bless our hearts with it. The word to proclaim, the power to change. As you will all remember in one incident in Luke chapter 6, Jesus spend an overnight prayer, and then the following day, he chose his disciples. He chose his disciples because eventually, they will become apostles. They will be called apostles. As you'll know, 
disciples, the word means student, learner. And Jesus chose learners for the purpose of making them apostles. Apostles literal means sent out ones. That's the purpose why there are disciples of Jesus. The purpose of being a disciple is not just to enjoy life uh, and being with Jesus. Of, of course, that is part of it. Or having a life uh, or experiencing a bed of roses in Christ. Yes, that is part of the package. Yes, but there is a specific purpose why Jesus wanted disciples. So that they will be sent out out there in the world to continue to proclaim the message of reconciliation the me- of, of God with man through Jesus Christ. We are people on a mission. And this the same operating uh, system that we have here at CCBC, very much represented by our vision statement. Send CCBC strategically engage in nations' discipleship. In other words, our operating system here is that we call people to be disciples, to be followers of Jesus, to learn from Jesus, to learn His Word. For what purpose? To be active members of the church? Well, that's part of it, but that's not the end of it. The end of disciple-making at Capital City Baptist Church It's not really an end, but the beginning of doing something is to be out there, sent out to bring the gospel, to proclaim the word, to demonstrate the power of Jesus, to bring transformation and change in our society. This is why we are in existence as CCBC. This is why you are a CCBCer. You ought to be a disciple and you ought to be preparing yourself to be sent out. Jesus was conscious in equipping his disciples with two things. And here we will see it in this narrative. He equips them with a word and he equips them with power. Let's take a look at the power of Christ's word. You could follow me in this sermon through the outline that's printed in your bulletins. We are presented with a, with a parable and that's the parable of the sower we are very familiar with it. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 8, Jesus gave the conclusion, when he said this, he called out. When he gave the parable, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. I mean, not literal hearing, but any person When the word of God is given to you, you have to receive it. That is what Jesus is saying. You know, Jesus spoke in parables. In one of the Gospels, it uh, it was explained that the parable is a demonstration of how the word of God works in our world today. You know, a parable is a simple story, but it encapsulates heavenly truths. The parable is so simple that you could easily ignore it and not really get its message. But the one who is seeking the truth, when they begin to listen to the parable, they would see the profundity of the message that it bears. That is the way the Word of God works. Sometimes it comes to us very, very simple. You know, you had to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. As simple as that. And many times I have heard objections such as this. What? Only that? You know, I don't have to give in church anymore. I don't have... What? It's just that I don't believe it. It would be that too simple for me to believe it. But it is that simple. You know, I'd like you to appreciate the impact of parable. If you'd like to appreciate the impact of the parable, outside our church building... There are three bulletin boards in the foyer. And I, who among you have seen the three phrases, key phrases in the bulletin boards in the foyer? Just raise your hand. There are six words there. Can you raise your hand? I'd like to count. Okay. There are at least eight people. In the second service, there were two people who only saw that. We, the, the bulletin board was there already for more than a month now. 
and I knew people wouldn't immediately see it. But if they find it, it will always be seen. The key phrases that describe the work of CCBC to the public. So if you haven't seen it, mamaya lumabas kayo, makikita ninyo. And if you cannot see it, stand across the street, you will see it. Okay? So that is how the Word of God, the power of Christ's Word, in other words, is this. It, 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 it is experience when there is a willingness to listen. You cannot experience the power of Christ's Word if you do not listen to the Word of God. Many people would come to CCBC, they would listen to the sermon, the sermon comes to this ear, and it goes out to the other ear. Walang nangyari. Some of us, you know, they will just come and do the motions of worshiping, but right after our fellowship, our worship service, you just set these things aside and go on with your business right out there when you leave the parking lot. Some would attend a COC, spend two hours, three hours with their COC group, studying the Word of God, unraveling the Word of God, and right after that, when they go home, they get ahead with their old business, never minding what the Word. They haven't listened. Yes, they were there. They haven't listened. Of course, part of listening would be an obedient attitude. If you want to experience the power of Christ's Word, these are two key elements that has to be present in you. You're willing to listen, absorb the Word of God, and you are willing to apply it in your life. There must be obedience to the Word of God. Just as Jesus mentioned in verse 15, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the Word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. You know what Jesus is teaching is this. When people listen to God's Word, and, when pe and they, they allow the Word of God to take root into their lives, this is where increase happens in their lives. It's just like seed that is sown on good soil. It will produce a good crop. There will be growth. There will be blessings. There will be maturity. Something happens. Change happens in the life of that person. But the critical thing is this. It is to allow the Word of God to take root, deep roots into their lives. In other words, it is allowing the Word of God to permeate every aspect of their life. It's not only their spiritual life, it's not only their Christian life, but it includes their family life, it includes their business life, their student life, their love life, whatever life it is. The Word of God should permeate every aspect of our life if we would like to experience the power of His Word to change. And you know what? There's an interesting uh, word that is used here to describe the kind of heart that to which the, the Word of God could take root. It says here, those with a noble and good heart. What's a noble heart? Well, it speaks about nobility. It speaks about something that's majestic. And as I reflect on it, I come to the conclusion that nobility in life comes not merely from the bloodline, you know, you came from the blue blood, but from the heart that is willing to keep the word of the king. You may be an ordinary person, but if you keep the word of the king of kings in your heart and in your life, you're like part of nobility. And that's what makes a noble person. The next thing that is needed to, about the power of Christ's word, aside from experiencing it, causing to see its change in your life, there needs to be a resolve to make the word known. Jesus talked about the story of a lamp that is... Uh, uh, the, the parable of the lighted lamp. He says in verse 16, No one lights a lamp and hides it. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. You know what Jesus is saying is that it is absurd for a person to light up a lamp and keep it under covers. It is 
illogical. It is foolish. You don't do it. When you light a lamp, you allow its light to filter, to, to, to illuminate the area around him. You don't put covers on it. And, and in, in a way, Jesus is emphasizing to his disciples that this is the purpose of God's revelation. This is the purpose why God gave us the Bible, His Word. It is not for our secret, private spirituality. It is something that ought to be brought out into the public, into the public arena, into the world. It is something that needs to be proclaimed around the world. And you and I, disciples, are supposed to be agents of that proclamation of God's Word. So Jesus was teaching His disciples to be prepared in knowing well the Word of God in order that they could help others obey the teaching of Jesus as well, so that they could help others follow Jesus as well. I know our, the objection of many of us. Sometimes, you know, we, we give a friend a Bible, we get this objection. Commonly, Filipinos were not readers. Once they see the Bible, their first objection, ang kapal. When they open the Bible, ang liit ng letra. The letters are too small. And then they will even complain there are no even pictures and drawings in this book. You know, oh, this will make me sleep immediately. <laughs> you know what? Uh, the Bible... In order for it, you know, in the, uh, in the Bible, there are, there are different Gospels. You know, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John. And perhaps your friend may not be able to open any of the Gospels. But Jesus expects us to have our own version of the Gospel. You know, by you living out God's word, you may be only be the gospel that your friend may read and may see. Like the gospel of Francis, you know, and the gospel of Rona, or the gospel of Shane, you know. You may only be the gospel that other people may be able to read. That's why it is important for us that the Word of God would truly permeate our lives. And it only happens by our willingness to listen and by our obedient attitude. I remember in college, we had this superstitious friend. You know, he treats the Bible as if it is an amulet, anting anting. He advised one of our batchmates saying, you want to do good in your final exams? On the eve of your final exams, be sure to put your Bible under the pillow, pray, and then sleep on it, you know, and God will bless your mind. <laughs> Mga kapatid, whatever you do, you can never learn by osmosis. It's only by reading, learning the Word of God, studying it, and living it out. Don't treat this as an amulet. You know, it has no special powers. The only... You can only experience the power of the Word of God if you listen to it and obey it. Apply it in your life. Now, right now, I want you to make a resolution. When you go out, there's at least one thing that you're going to do in application of the Word of God. You know? Think about that one thing. What are you going to do as a result? Of hearing this. Now, the letter B stands for something else. The next story that we find in, in Luke chapter 8 is the story of the encounter of Jesus, brothers and mothers coming to visit in one of the public ministry places of Jesus. It says in verses 19 and 20, Jesus, mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. According to some students of the Bible, they're saying these family members of Jesus, they're kind of 
they, his brothers are not yet believers back then. And they were wondering what Jesus is doing. They want to pull him out of the place. They wanted to stop him, what he's doing. And they are using their privilege as family members so that they can approach Jesus personally. There are many people who wanted to come and meet Jesus personally. And how did Jesus respond to that? He says in verse 21, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and puts it into practice. What is Jesus saying? Is he rejecting his mothers and brothers? Is he being rude to them? No, no, he's not doing that. You know, he immediately took the occasion with his mothers and brothers saying that we have this intimate fellowship, relationship with Jesus, so we have the privilege to come near him. And he is saying this, you know what? If you're a person who studies my word and applies my word, obeys my word in your life, you are to me like a mother. You are to me like a brother or a sister. What is Jesus saying to his disciples? Jesus is saying that to those who follow him, to who, those who live out his word, he becomes devoted to them. He's speaking about this intimate relationship. We grow in our intimacy with Christ when we live out God's word. So studying and applying God's word in life really is a spiritual discipline. It's a means by which we develop our intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, if you do this, you know, all the more my attitude to you, I will treat you like as if you're my mother or you're my brother. That's the first part of Luke chapter 8. And then there's another part, a series of stories that talks about Christ's power. The first story is the calming of the stormy sea. And then second is the healing of the uh, demon-possessed man in Gerasene. And then the third one is the healing of the bleeding woman and then the raising of the girl. Let's take a look, brief look, uh, survey of these stories. You know, after that incident of the visitation of Jesus' mothers and brothers, Jesus decided to go to the other side of the lake. Since some of his disciples were fishermen, they were able to secure a boat and, and uh, get across the lake. You know, Lake uh, Galilee is kind of unpredictable. There will be sudden changes of weather. Suddenly it would be calm and then, and then there will be a squall, a storm. And then it so happens while they were in the middle of the lake, a, a storm, a, a, a rogue wind came and it, it caused the waves to rise. And as a result, it almost filled the boat. The boat was already sinking. And the people in the boat, the disciples decided, okay, let's be prepared so, we, so nobody perishes. So they woke up Jesus. Gising, gising. Lulubog na tayo. Parang ganyan. And then Jesus, when he woke up, what he did was he commanded the winds to stop and the waves to stop. And immediately it became calm. And as a result, and then Jesus turned to his disciples. He told them, up until now, you still don't have faith in me. Telling them that you don't know who I am. And then the disciples whispered to each other and they said these words. Who is this? He even commands the wind and the water and they obey him. Who is this? These are kind of a rhetorical question. The answer was not given. But try to answer that question. How would you answer that question? Who is this? Who is this Jesus? What is going on in the minds of his disciples when they saw Jesus commanding the waves and the winds? If they are people of the scriptures, perhaps what comes to their mind are the stories in the Old Testament. When when the world was created, they were created by the power of the word of God. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be land. God said, let the waters move. And God said, let there be plants. And God said, let there be birds in the air. God said, let there be stars in the sky. It was by the word of God that all things are created. And that's the thing that the disciples remember. That's why they ask themselves, who 
is this? That must be God. And that's what exactly Jesus is revealing to them by demonstrating His power. He has that creation power in Him. The Apostle Paul affirms the conclusion of the disciples and this is how he's, he said it and he writes. Let's read together. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. So this speaks about the potency of the Word of Christ. Now letter O, the Word of Christ is also capable of setting the oppressed free. And we are going to talk now, we, we are led now to another story, and that is the story of the release of the uh, gathering demoniac, the one who is a um, uh, demon-possessed man. And what kind of a person was he? Well, he was described as one who is naked, who cannot wear clothes, very, very indecent. And then he's very powerful. There are so many spirits that are controlling him, and no one can subdue him. He was in chains, but he's able to escape, and he lives among the dead. He lives in a cemetery. You know, in as much that he is powerful, he's very wild, and he sows terror to his town mates. But Jesus came over, and the man encountered him. And what has happened? The man was released from his oppressors. And as a result of that freedom, as a result of that release, there was change. The man was changed from his being a wild man to be a decent person. That is what Jesus can do to us when we encounter him, when he demonstrates his power to us. He can release us from the things that are keeping us from doing the, the things that we want to do for his glory. And when he releases us, then we experience his, uh, uh, we experience change. And then another story that speaks about an encounter that brings healing. It's about this woman who has an issue of blood for 12 years. And secretly she decided, I'm going to approach Jesus from behind. I, 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 if I could only touch his cloak, just, just his cloak, perhaps I will be healed. You know, why did that woman think that way? Back then, the days of Jesus, when women are having their menstrual period, they are considered as ceremonially unclean. And then another thing about their laws is that these women, you know, they can cause uncleanness to other people, especially to rabbis, to people, holy people. So they have to isolate themselves. They have to ostracize themselves. That is only during their menstrual period. But it says in Scripture that this woman had this bleeding constantly for the past 12 years. So there is not only a physical ailment, she also has this social ailment. She has to ostracize herself. She felt rejected. She is avoided by people for all those years. But she, she saw Jesus in the crowd. And she knew in her heart perhaps Jesus could help. But she does not want to pass her uncleanness to him. That's why she decided just, just the tip of his cloak. And when she was able to touch him, Jesus felt it. And he said, who touched me? The disciples responded. They said, Lord, there's so many people pressing on you. Why do you ask who touched you? Because I felt power coming out of me. In other words, he has that sensitivity to know these people who are even ignored, you know, and as a result, uh, the woman was healed. And then when she knew it was that woman, Jesus declared, your faith has healed you. And what is that? What does he mean? It was that complete reliance of that woman on the power of Jesus Christ, on the power of God to bring healing and restoration. So that encounter with Jesus that brings healing is also an experience of the power of God to bring change and transformation 
in our lives. And of course, later on in the story, in the chapter, we saw a prominent man, Jairus, coming over to Jesus, asking Jesus to visit his daughter at home who is terribly sick. And on their way home, they saw people weeping already. The daughter is dead. And Jesus said, she's not dead. She's just asleep. We don't know if she's under coma or something. But the point of the story is Jesus used his power to resurrect persons from the dead. And by his resurrection, we know and we have this faith that we too will also be resurrected, those who are in Christ. You know, the power of Jesus to raise people from the dead demonstrates for us that this power is available not only to raise dead people, but to raise a lot of dead issues in our life. You know, we are surrounded by people who are dead already in their marriage, who are dead in terms of their relationship with their fathers. Their relationship with their brothers is already dead, you know. There are many areas in our life that in as much that we're still living, we're already dead in those areas. But you know what? Jesus is saying that His power is available to bring restoration and resuscitation on those dead, on the dead. If He can do it with the physically dead, He can do it with the things that are dead in us. So what are these things that the Bible or Luke chapter 8 is demonstrating to us and demonstrating to his disciples. First thing is that Jesus wanted his disciples to be faithful in proclaiming the word, to be faithful in declaring the word out there. They'll become instruments in bringing the world across the nations. And at the same time, another element, important element, of the ministry of the disciples is the exercise and the application of the power of Christ. That they will be able to see and witness and apply the mighty intervention of Christ in their life. Pastor, that's too complex. Actually, there are two things, two areas, two elements to which Jesus is equipping his disciples. One is competency in the word. Two is competency in prayer. Word and prayer. Word and prayer. You know, when, when, when I disciple people, there are, and I will tell them, you know, what are the two things that I would like to see from them? It is this. I want you to be competent eventually in the Word, meaning you know how to apply God's Word in your life. And second, I want you to know how it is to pray. Because if you know how it is to pray, then you will be able to witness the mighty demonstration of the power of Christ around you and in you. And it is in these two areas that Jesus is equipping his disciples that they may be able to handle the word and proclaim it to others and that they may be able to demonstrate it, uh, the, the power of Christ. In, in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it says here, When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure the diseases. He gave them power to be able to do that. And then another thing, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. Do you see that? Two areas to which the disciples are going to accomplish the ministry. Proclamation of the word and the demonstration of Christ's power. I tell you, brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are all called to do this. We are being discipled by Christ. For what purpose? To be sent out there to proclaim God's word and to be witnesses to the power of Christ. You know, we talk about community transformation. We are not going to transform community merely by programs, by NGO work, and by all those things. Transformation happens by the intervention of the power of Christ. By the intervention of the power of Christ. 
So brothers and sisters in the Lord, I want you to step out, step up now. You know, among us, I know that there are many of us celebrating already their anniversaries in their COCs, in your small groups. Perhaps it has been years that you have been together, studying God's Word together, and you're growing. Praise the Lord. I celebrate with you. But I want to use the words of the writer to the Hebrews to challenge us now. And the writer to the Hebrews says it, you ought to be teachers by now. You ought to be people who are leading others by now. You ought to be standing up by now, helping others follow Jesus Christ, obey His word and apply His word in their lives by now. CCBCers, this is the purpose why we do discipleship here. Because we want to see you go out in the presence and the blessing of God to be God's channel of blessing to the people out there in our city, in your neighborhood, in our society, among the unreached, and demonstrate the power of Christ to bring a change. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the assurance of your presence. Just as Jesus promised, I will be with you to the end of the age. You will always be with us, Lord. We pray, I pray, Father, for my brothers and sisters here, those who are responding to the challenge, Cause them, Lord, to truly rise up, live out your word, demonstrate your word, and be witnesses to your power, and that your power, Lord, would be experienced by the people around us, Lord, and that change would happen, Lord, in lives and hearts and families and even in our society, O oh Lord. Lord, we really long for the change that will bring about you. Intervene, Lord, in our city and in our nation today. Use us, Lord, your servants, your disciples, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.